Welcome to The Pulse, where we dive deep into the issues and ideas that are shaping the future of education. I'm your temporary host, Mr. Ian Bose, 2024 Putnam County Teacher of the Year and host of the Bose Knows Podcast. We'll be doing a crossover episode today with you, so we hope you enjoy. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or just someone who cares about education, this podcast is for you. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into The Pulse. Welcome to The Pulse, but I am not Superintendent Rick Serency. I am Ian Bose, host of The Bose Knows, and I am hosting this podcast takeover where I turn the tables on Superintendent Serency and ask him questions. Thanks for letting me turn the tables on you today. Well, welcome, and uh, <laughs> I feel very honored that you're asking the questions today, so glad to be here. Great. So my podcast always starts out asking my guests with uh, the same couple of questions, so I want to ask you uh, the same ones. So you've been around schools as a teacher, leader, superintendent for a long time. Um, I won't give away the number of years, but if you want to disclose that, you can. Um, Over that time, what's your favorite story or tradition that you've been able to be a part of? Well, funny you ask that. Um, I always tell a story when I do some of my presentations. You know, it's always great to see a former student who comes up to you and and has some kind of story about when you were their teacher and how you impacted them. Several years ago, I had a probably a 40-something-year-old man come up to me in Walmart and said, "Um, hey, you taught me back in the 1980s. And I didn't know his name, but I pretended like I knew about it. And uh, and he was describing my class and all that, and I said, that's great. And all of a sudden, he said something that really struck struck me. He says, do you remember the day your overhead projector caught on fire? And, of course, a lot of people may not know what an (laughs) overhead projector is. But I used one extensively, and I was a history teacher, so I gave a lot of notes. I said, yeah, how'd you know that? He says, I'm the one that set it on fire. <laughs> and uh, I said, I guess I need to write you up or something, <laughs> but the statute of limitations might, might be gone. But, you know, with all that, it did strike a chord with me later on that uh, he really talked about my instructional practices. He said, you know, copying notes and then you lecturing really did not engage us as students. And uh, obviously, he took it in, into his own <laughs> hands. And uh, I stepped out of the room, you know, that time. And I guess he shoved some paper on the bulb and lesson over. But that really stuck with me that uh, students to this day could remember something like that. And just how important instruction is and how important it is to engage our students. I think that is really Im- It gets lost sometimes, just the impact we have on our students and, and ultimately on the community. Absolutely. Yep. So great. All right. So my next question uh, is that I ask all my guests is if you could time travel, when would you go and why? Well, that's a great question. Being a former history teacher, I love the idea of time travel and and just going back to a time. And I'll tell you the time that I really enjoyed teaching uh, when I taught students in American history was the World War II era. And to me, that was it seemed like such a simple life. And, you know, we call them the greatest generation. And, uh, you know, just the way people were, um, this is simple life, and people really appreciated being around each other. And I think today, you know, technology has kind of uh, become such a part of our life, which is good. But I think back in the 40s, I think it was just a time where people really engaged people on on a person-by-person basis. So that's probably where I would go. That's beautiful. I know I've started taking, turning off my phone for, for some time and disconnecting. It's been great. Um, all right, so let's get into it a little bit. So what's your, what's your story of education? How did you get into it? How did you start your journey to where you are today? Well, that's funny you ask that because today I had a student advisory meeting, and I actually talked to them about what got me into education. And um, I was a football player, football coach, and all that. But the thing that really drew me into education is I wanted to be a football coach. And I knew that in order to be a football coach, I had to be working in a school eventually. So I went into education, and my brother, you know, took the same route. Was a, um, he was a teacher, history teacher, and a coach, and I kind of followed his path too. And As a matter of fact, he and I coached together at one time. And then um, once I kind of went through my years of coaching and it kind of ran its course and I was teaching – I really became interested in the field of education and how I could maybe uh, become more involved and became involved as a, you know, a school leader and so forth. But um, 
that was where I started. I actually started as a instructional assistant, 1978, which I, if my math is right, about 46 <laughs> years ago. And, you know, while I was in college, and then I became a teacher right after that. So is I think everybody who goes into education has their own reasons why. And mine was originally not to be a teacher, but to be a coach. Right. Absolutely. And now here you are, superintendent, and you had the honor of being nominated as uh, Florida's 2024 Superintendent of the Year. Or actually so, 23. Or 23, sorry. Yeah. getting Giving you two years credit there. <laughs> um, so what was that like to receive that honor, and what did it mean to you to receive it? Well, without question, that, that has been the honor of my life, uh, you know, from a career standpoint. And, you know, to be honored as a um, you know, one of 67 in the state of Florida, you know, is truly, um, I'm very honored and, and um, I feel very respected by doing that. But I tell everybody, although it, it has my name on the honor, it really is about the people in this district. And it really talks about the culmination of all the work that we've done at the district level, at the school level. I mean, every employee, I think, has had something to do with the success. And I just happened to be the one they recognized. But um, very honored to uh, receive that uh, award back in 2023. That's great. So you talked about um, Putnam County having all of these great things and all these people that work together uh, to make Putnam County schools great. What are some of the initiatives that you're kind of most proud of um, that either you've started or you've continued or that maybe led to that nomination? Well, thank you for asking. And I think the number one thing that um, people look at as far as Putnam County is the way we've improved our graduation rates from a 54.9% in 2015 to a, a high of 92.5% in 2022. And all along the way, we just kept, you know, m moving up the ladder. And I'm proud of that because, again, we had a number of people that were behind that. They developed a very systematic plan that has been incorporated in everything we do now. It's really just part of our work now. But um, I think really uh, what we are doing after that, you know, our portrait of a graduate, we're, we're preparing students for life after high school. It's more than just getting them across the <laughs> stage in four years. And a lot of our expansion of our acceleration programs, including QI and yep. Crescent City and our uh, Palaka High in Larkin High, each of those high schools have some type of uh, post-secondary uh, college program, and, I, and I'm very excited about that. And we've also expanded our CTE offerings across all of our high schools. And really, our STEM initiative, I think, has been re nationally recognized because we offer STEM to kindergarten students all the way through 12th grade. So we're really trying to prepare our students for uh, jobs that don't even exist yet. And I think we will see you know, in the very near future, we're going to see the, the fruit of our labor because a lot of these students are going to move in some really fantastic jobs uh, because of the STEM programs that we're offering. You know, the other thing I'm very proud of, and I, I want to thank the citizens of Putnam County for entrusting our district in passing the $300 million bond issue. And I know a lot of people have some questions about, you know, when are we going to see new buildings and all that kind of stuff? Well, we have three buildings in being built right now in different stages. Two of the buildings are built with bond money and one's being built with state special facilities money. But we have put together a plan that, you know, will build nine schools over the next 10 years. And to me, that's very, very aggressive, very innovative. But again, it's because of the citizens of Putnam County said they wanted a up-to-date school system that we're, we're our, and school facilities where our students will be safe and have all the amenities that any other district would have. So I think with all that, all that put together, I think uh, people recognize that Putnam County is doing something that not an average county is doing, and we do, do it on a very fast time schedule. And I believe my recognition just reflects all that hard work. So one of the things you said that I kind of want to tease out a little bit, because I'm not sure if all the listeners know what it is, but you talked about your um, – superintendent, the student council that you have. Mm -hmm. What is that? Because I, as a teacher, I think it's really important to listen to my students because like they know best how they learn and how they want the classroom to feel and stuff. And I think it's, 
I think it's wonderful that as the superintendent, you have that same thought process. So I'd like to know more. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I had one of those meetings today. And about four or five times during the year, we assemble students from all four of our high schools and including our charter schools, uh, our charter middle school, and, and including Mellon Learning Center. So we, we um, have a group of students that principals have nominated. They are transported to the district office, and I personally meet with them. And we have different activities, but the main thing I want to find out from them is what's working and what can we do to make things better. And like I tell people, when you ask a teenager a question and you want information, they're going to give it to you <laughs> straight straight to you. Yeah, you've got to be ready for what they say if you yeah. ask for that opinion. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think it's been one of the best things we've done. And the, the students really enjoy it, too. And they just like interacting. And, and sometimes I bring in, like today, I brought in some of our departments and shared with them. And they asked students about what could they do to make, you know, to um, – be more effective with students. So to me, the students are our customers. And if we don't listen to them and hear the student voice, I think we all as adults are missing the boat. And I've learned so much by listening to our students. And I, I think it's going to make us work harder and we're going to be better for what we do. Absolutely. I had the honor of bringing one of our students uh, to a conference this last week for superintendents, district leaders, and stuff across the state to hear from a student panel and hear their thoughts. So Absolutely. Students are the are the thing we need to keep first and foremost Absolutely. Uh, yep. in mind. So we've talked about all the great things coming to Putnam County and all the great things that you've done, but you've had your tenure as superintendent has been through some unique changes uh, in education and some challenges. So what's what do you think has been uh, a challenge that you've had to face as superintendent uh, to overcome and to continue to lead Putnam County schools into the future? Well, there's two um, two main events in my tenure, and I was elected in 16. So the past eight years, the two things I think has really um, come to mind immediately. First of all, the the tragedy at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas completely changed education in Florida as well as the United States, but especially in Florida. And for those of you that recall that time, you know, all school districts, you know, were mandated. By, this took place in February, and they were mandated by the next fall. They had to have uh, some things in place to be uh, compliant with the law. And the one thing we had to do was uh, arm or have someone armed in every school. And at that time, you know, it was very difficult to have the funds to hire deputies or even find deputies put in every school. So. You know, we, we've talked about it a lot, but this is the time that we created the uh, Guardian program in um, Putnam County, one of the first districts to do that. And I worked closely with the sheriff, and it's very controversial. I mean, it brought out people that were on each side of the gun issue, but all in all, we were able to pass that with the school board, and we implemented it. And to me, it's been one of the most effective ways to um, keep our, our students safe. And, again, no one knows who the guardians are, but they are highly trained. They are school personnel, not necessarily classroom teachers, but people in the schools who will be the first people to, to respond if there's an armed intruder. And we have signs on campus that warn people. We have people armed and will do whatever it takes to protect our students. So that's the first thing. And then, of course, the uh, March of 2020, we all remember the beginning of the pandemic which again has shaped education for generations, I think. And we overnight had to change to a, you know, online educational system. And probably one of the most difficult times, yet one of the most uh, changing as far as changing the way we deliver education. And, you know, through, I don't think we had that many Zoom meetings, if any, prior to then. But now a Zoom meeting or virtual meeting is just part of our way of work now. But again, going through the pandemic and all the heartache and the difficulties of that, but now we are still feeling the, the impact of the pandemic and will for years to come. So those two have, it really stand out as been the, uh, the things that probably were the biggest challenges to me. Yeah, the... The pandemic, especially as a classroom teacher, I see it 
very regularly where I'm like, why are my kids struggling with this? And then I think backwards through the through the curricular progression and go, ah, that's, you know, well, that was the spring that you were supposed to learn that and you weren't in the classroom or, you know. Well, last night I actually had the opportunity to speak to 110 of our top scholars. And uh, I actually mentioned in my comments, these were the freshmen the year the pandemic started. And actually freshmen in the um, fall of 2020, and now they're graduating and they have overcome so much that, you know, we don't realize what those students had overcome, and now they are achieving at a high level. And I also want to mention, too, being a former history teacher, that the time that the pandemic started, I actually went back to our vault, and I found the school board minutes from 1918, <laughs> and it's a book about this thick, and I went back, and, I, and these are all handwritten notes, and I actually found out what our school district did in 1918 during the Spanish flu that pandemic and of course we canceled school and then once the kids came back they had to add day uh, time to the day to make up for the lost time yeah it's interesting to see how different generations (laughs) have dealt with it yeah absolutely um so last couple of things here as we wrap up our time together Mm -hmm. um what advice would you give a new teacher or a student that's considering education or some other field in the school district as a career And this could be a great recruiting video, right? (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, I'm always advocating for, um, you know, people to go into education. But I think the biggest thing is understanding your why. You know, what is it that you as a potential teacher or someone who's going off to college, you know, what is your why? What what do you want to see happen in years to come? And if it is pouring into other people, if you're in the people business, if you don't really – and I don't want to say not make good money because we are the pay for teachers has gone up, maybe not as high as a lot of people would like. But, but again, people don't go into education to necessarily make a fortune. And, but we try to pay them a living wage. But the number one thing is, and I told the students today, I went into education because I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to see people improve and I want to see – the thing that we all value is people coming back later and saying, you made a difference in my life. And I would just, my number one advice is understand your why and make sure that, um, you know, you understand that teaching are for people who really care about other people. It's not how smart you are necessarily. It's about, can you engage another human being and make a difference in their life? Absolutely. I would agree with that a hundred percent. Would that advice change if you were talking to, say, teachers or staff that are wanting to take the next step in their career? Teacher that wants to go into administration or a parapro that wants to go uh, to be a teacher or anything like that? Well, you know, the number one word that comes to mind when you ask that question is the word impact. And I think where we are at the current time is we always have to ask our question, am I making the most impact on other people than I could be making right now? A pair pro normally works with a, a defined group of students in a, in a limited way, but again, they, they're working with them. And if that pair pro feels like, hey, you know, I could have a bigger impact if I was actually the teacher and I actually developed the lesson plans and I had whole classes. So that's one thing. And as a teacher who might want to go into a leadership position, they might say, you know what? I think I have some skills where I could really impact more students and more employees by being in a different position. So again, I think people have to ask themselves, am I at the point to where I could grow and make a larger impact on, on um, than I'm making right now? So that's the number one thing I'd want people to consider. And um, I really do think it's about how can I influence and change other people for the better? And if you can do that on a larger scale, then I would encourage you to keep looking for um, advancements. I love that. All right, last question I have for you. If you, we talked about all the changes, all the things you've seen, all the challenges. Um, if you had a magic wand, right, and you could wave it and make one change about education as a whole, what would you change? Well, that's a powerful question. And um, I'll tell you, I had a unique experience uh, recently, almost two years ago. I, I was able to visit the country of Finland, and I toured their schools. And Finland, as you know, is one of the top academically achieving nations in the world. So 
a group of educators and myself went over there, and I came back with so many ideas and so many thoughts about how the United States could really make some changes. And, of course, we can't be like another Finland necessarily. But there are some things that I brought back that I, I, if I had a magic wand, I think would be important for me to wave the wand. <laughs> and number one, number one thing is remember children are children. And one thing they that the Finnish do over there is they have time built in for children to play. And every every hour they give 15 minutes to their children hmm. to go outside and play. That's part of their, their daily work. And what that does is it really balances work and play, and it develops those leadership skills with kids. They go out there and they engage, and they, but they learn how to play and just be a child. And sometimes I think, do we put too much pressure on our children to always achieve, always achieve without them being a child? The second thing I would do is I would uh, make sure that people respect the profession of education, starting with our teachers. Our teachers are professionals. Teachers in Finland are considered, they're revered over there. They're treated like doctors, lawyers, engineers are in the United States. And they are looked at for their professional opinion. They don't always have to have some kind of objective test to find out how a child is doing. <laughs> they ask the teacher. So to me, I just think we need to elevate the profession of teaching and just education as a whole in the United States. And I think the United States sometimes uses education as a, you know, kind of a political tool sometimes. But I think we need to step back and let kids be kids and really revere our teachers. All right, well, I don't know a better way to end it than that. Um, so, listeners of The Pulse, if you want to uh, hear more of me interview teachers and students and staff to share their stories, check out The Bose Knows. Um, but, Dr. Cerency, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you for letting me take over your podcast. I really do appreciate you doing that. I think you're, you and I talked about it. You're engaging students and teachers and really telling, helping to tell their story. So, best of luck to you. Thank and you. Thank you, audience, for allowing me the opportunity to share some of the things I do. I'm usually not on this side of the podcast, but uh, it's been a, a great experience. So be sure to tune in for our next podcast, and uh, information will be shared, and it can be found on our uh, website and information on our Facebook page. Have a great day.